I was a boy, I believed that the sea was boundless and indestructible to human pressures. Now I know better. Fish live in there because they destroyed their habitat. As a nation, if we're undermining the traditional maritime use, we need or climate change, land-based source of pollution, habitat loss and degradation. And these are taking away somebody's rights and liberties. There's going to be a moment of truth for everybody. Everybody says, put it out there. Who cares what happens out there? Let's just get it out of my sight. What's on Mars, but we can't figure out what's in our oceans. Oops, it's almost a joke. Most of the world's coral reefs are bleached or dying. There are dead zones the size of small states off our coast. Most of the biggest fish have been harvested, and there are places where jellyfish have become the catch of the day. And all at a time when we have to deal with aquaculture, wind and wave energy, even oil and gas exploration that are staking claims in our waters. The government's going to do it, and they're going to take everything. But I have also learned there's a smarter, more lasting course than the one we're on. At a time when our demands of the ocean are expanding at an unprecedented rate, and the failures of our outdated, piecemeal way of managing this life-giving resource are becoming abundantly clear, the time has come for a fresh approach based on stewardship through cooperation. In the small fishing community of Port Orford, Oregon, Aaron Longton and his colleagues are making a living off the sea in what they hope is a lasting way. A way that serves not only the community of Port Orford, but the sea life that sustains them in return. Port Orford's long-term outlook for the waters that feed them is part of a blossoming movement to take better care of the ocean for the good of all. It is a movement of scientists, businesses, fishermen, farmers, governments, and citizens who care for the sea. When you rub it one way, you'll notice that it's smooth. And if you rub it the other way, it gets a little bit rough. It feels like sandpaper, right? In 2010, the United States adopted its first ever national ocean policy. A policy that now calls for bringing together people from across the societal spectrum to carry out a new, far-sighted strategy for sustaining the country's ocean, coasts, and Great Lakes. It is founded on a branch of conservation, more formally known as ecosystem-based management, more simply, as a common sense approach to preserving life. It is backed by science and based on the needs of the human community in balance with that of its ecological provider, the sea. So we have things that happen right here in Iowa that end up affecting folks thousands of miles away, fishermen trying to fish in the Gulf of Mexico. Shipping is extremely important to this economy. We generate about a million jobs in California. One in eight jobs in Southern California is associated with the port activity. And then nationwide, it's between three and four million jobs. So I see marine spatial planning as a tool that will help ports uh, delineate the area where traditional maritime uses are going to be protected. Scientific research. Do we need it? We're finally getting it. Thanks to our reserve. If it's not too late. No, it's not too late. Our I said is. if. Yes, it's not. To meet some of the movement's pioneers, we will journey from coast to coast, as well as the land between. From the fishing community of Port Orford, Oregon, to farmers along the Mississippi River, to the Gulf of Mexico. From divers in the Florida Keys, 
to whale researchers and industrial shippers in Massachusetts Bay. All are now practicing a new philosophy of marine stewardship, of prosperity through preservation. <laughs>